Yeah, so good morning. Um, yeah, as I said, I'm also a founder, um, and that's why I'm so grateful to work with the Federal Agency for Disruptive Innovation because they help us making our dreams come true. Um, and you will hear you will hear more about Sprint um, later during this presentation. So this is what we're going to talk about. Um, the question: How can we address global health challenges such as virus threats and cancer? And of course, the answer is uh, in new technologies and um, technologies that allow you to do better or more earlier um, diagnos diagnosis on and better treatments, of course, are also needed. And um, one opportunity um, to address these challenges with new technologies um, is presented by working with a new fabrication technology, which is um, well known under, under the name of Dean Origami. And so you can see this kind of fancy background image there. And this has been generated by um, uh, generative AI, like Midjourney in this case. And it has really nothing to do with what Dean Origami actually is. So it just tells you that it's actually very little known in the world, um, very little data available. You, you can train these AIs with Dean Origami because very few people know about it. And also there's little data traces. So you can feel a little bit privileged today to uh, get a crash course in what the origami actually is. Um, so, yeah, so first to understand uh, the length scales we're going to talk about, uh, uh, I want to show a few pictures so that you get a better impression of what that actually is. So this is a scanning electron micros microscopy image um, of human hair. So some of you, I guess I can't see you, have hair, so you can touch it uh, and then feel it. So the diameter is typically 50 micrometers. Um, so then maybe you can see this small rectangle here. I'm um, going to make this a little bit larger. So um, this is also a scanning electron micrograph. In this case, it was taken from a E. coli bacteria, which all of you have uh, many, many of them in, in your guts. So um, and such a bacterium is like about two micrometers in length, so much, much smaller than uh, human hair. Maybe I can switch back. Um, right? You just imagine you do this mental leap and blowing up this image, and then maybe you've spotted this tiny little sphere here. Um, so I'm going to make that larger again. Um, so I mean, this object actually has been, it's a synthetic object, has been fabricated from DNA. So this is a nanofabricated DNA shell, and uh, it's also data, it's basically a tomogram that has been acquired from uh, this kind of structures using a fancy type of electron microscopy. It's 100 nanometer in diameter, so uh, same size like a coronavirus, for example. And it's completely synthetic and has been built from DNA molecules. So that's the scale um, we're going to talk about. Very small. So, um, and with DNA origami, you can build all kind of um, nanoscale structures in solution from DNA molecules. Here's a, uh, just an ensemble of objects that we have built um, in my laboratory over the last couple of years. Everything that's um, yellow or blue consists of hun entirely 100% of designed uh, DNA molecules with designed sequences. There's actually no real difference in yellow or blue. It's just that it looks nicer. Um, and everything you see here, um, is data. All of these objects that you, that you see flying around, they have been validated and determined experimentally using electron microscopy. So these objects actually look like that. And uh, for give you a sense of scale again, there are two objects also from natural origin for a scale reference here. This is a hepatitis B virus, core capsid, 35 nanometer diameter. And then there's a protein, a membrane protein. Um, also for comparison, so with DNA origami, you can build objects design objects with a huge variety of shapes which are commensurate in dimensions to um, natural macromolecular complexes as small as individual proteins and also viruses. Um, so how do you build objects like that out of DNA molecules? So normally, I guess most of you in the audience, um, you know about the DNA double helix. So that's um, like the form in which our genome is typically stored. Um, DNA double helix consists of two individual DNA molecules, which by themselves are actually quite floppy. And if the sequence of chemical building blocks in these DNA molecules follows a certain pattern, and which is called Wat Watson-Crick sequence complementarity, um, then two molecules in solution, when they bump each other through diffusion, they will find each other and then wrap around and form a much stiffer DNA double helix like this. Now, let's say you wanted to build an object out of um, 
DNA molecules, how would you how would you do that? How can you imagine doing that? Well, it's a little bit like weaving a fabric out of DNA molecules. So let's say you wanted to build a sheet out of DNA molecules, um, which looks like this. So it's like a sheet where, where you have multiple DNA double helices arranged in parallel. And then there's also each DNA double helix here has a certain length. So you can actually approximate a target shape uh, in, in this one sheet with uh, DNA double helices. I think you can imagine then also if you were able to also stack multiple sheets on top of each other in the z-direction with different envelopes, you can approximate also more complicated three-dimensional shapes. And the key to be able to um, make such, a, such an object, such a fabric, is really to form connections between DNA double helices. And the beauty is that uh, DNA molecules will make those connections for you by themselves if you just program the sequences correctly. So let's zoom in here into one of those junctions, which is in fact formed by four DNA molecules. So we have this blue one in the bottom here, there's another blue one at the top, and then there's a purple molecule and a orange molecule. And the only thing you need to do in order to make these molecules come together and form such a junction is to give them the right sequence. In this case, um, the first half of this purple molecule needs to be reverse complementary to this sequence segment here in the blue molecule and, and immediately followed by a, a second sequence element which needs to be complementary to this portion of the blue molecule and likewise for the orange one. I mean, that's a very high level description, but in principle, you can go about this problem very systematically with the help of some software and you can then encode basically practically arbitrary structures in, DNA, in sets of DNA sequences. And these sequences, they encode the three-dimensional structures and can be hundreds of DNA molecules, thousands of DNA molecules, and as a, as a system, they encode the target object. Then what you need to do is um, you actually uh, need to make these molecules somehow. Um, and um, these days we can use chemical synthesis, for example, to uh, use actually robots synthesis robots so that they will make all of these molecules for you and then you know you get a liquid solution that contains uh, each of them um, these uh, you know billions of copies of these DNA single strands. Then you mix this all together into one common solution and then um, basically with, a little, with the help of a little heat and some other ingredients these molecules will start diffusing around um, and they will individually try to form connections with each other which are optimal in terms of stability. And optimal means that sort of maximizing the number of base pairs that are formed. And by, by the way we design these structures, basically the only solution for the entire system in which the number of base pairs formed is maximum is the design structure. So in this example, the target structure is a nanoscale rod. Maybe it's not a very exciting shape, but um, it is in fact exciting because it's, a co it's an atomically precise structure uh, which assembles itself and every point in the structure is pre-planned. It can be addressed with a chemical modification. You can attach something there. You know exactly where each base in is in this object. And you can go and experimentally validate then the three-dimensional structure. Um, and this is another important point I'd like to show you so um, that you better understand sort of the nature of these types of objects. Is, um, of course, we're making objects which are extremely small, much smaller than anything that can be fabricated with any top-down fabrication method uh, these days, so we of course we need to validate whether or not in this soup uh, we actually get what we wanted to get. No? So precision design needs precision validation. So we actually spend a lot of effort um, with a sort of fancy um, microscopy method called cryo-electron microscopy. Um, so what we do is basically we have our solution, aqua solution, which con ideally contains the products of our synthesis reaction. We shock freeze the solution very quickly so that the water actually doesn't have time to crystallize. So you get what is called a vitrified ice, like a glassy, amorphous, but solid phase of water, at very uh, cold temperatures. You put this in an electron microscope, and then you can basically look through this uh, thin layer of ice, and you get a micrograph that looks like this. It's a little bit like taking an x ray, but it's taking an x ray for molecules. So then you see um, all of this uh, gray stuff is the contrast, basically, that's caused by the you know, solid water, and then you can see there's some stuff that which is basically somehow embedded in this ice. So in the ideal case, um, all of these objects are basically copies of the same object, which are sort of trapped in different orientations uh, in this ice layer. And it's basically like taking an x-ray of your hand from different angles, basically you get different transmission projections um, from the same object. So now you can use machine learning, learning algorithms to sort through thousands of these individual particle images 
and figure out whether or not they can be, um, uh, be made consistent with one common structure. So in this case, they can. So you, this is sort of an intermediate result from such an ana analysis. You be reconstructing a 3D volume um, from all of this thousands and thousands of individual particle micrographs. Um, and then the sphere which you see here floating around, that actually um, gives you the statistics of how many particles in this data set have been identified with a particular viewing angle for the common structure. And if the sphere is fully covered, you have many, you have a high, uh, high quality data set, then you get a decent resolution and you can actually look at your synthesis product in, in its full beauty. In this case, it's a hexagonal barrel made from uh, 126 um, helices and um, bundled up in parallel. And you can kind of see all of these cool features where the double helix is famous for, like major minor groove and connections in between them. For some objects, you can go to high resolution. This is another example. It's just an object which really has no purpose. It's just cubes stacked on top of each other, which we use to troubleshoot some um, design features. And, but it's really beautiful in, in the sense you can really see major minor groove and these connections between the helices. And what you can also see is sort of all the flaws that you built in this object like, for example, you can see here there's some defect, systematic defect, which maybe shouldn't be there. Also, it's a global twist deformation. So when you have this kind of data quality, you can go and really engineer the target object to your specifications. This is zoom and detail in this object, which I personally find very uh, compelling. It's really the, the two pieces in the inner is the double helices, and connections between them. Um, so if I rotate this a little bit for you, what I want to point out is that this single connection here is a single chemical bond. It's a covalent bond. You can see that in an electron microscope. So you can imagine with this quality, you can go and really try to position atoms and molecules with very high resolution in the context of these structures. So then um, with some further analysis, you can also construct atomic models from this data. Um, so for example, for this test, we made this one object and it had all these flaws like defects. It was de deformed. We went back and analyzed the data the atomic model, and we made a new variant, uh, which then was straight. Uh, so this, this one, you know, the second variant went through all the microscopy again, constructed atomic model, is completely straight, all the defects are, uh, are fixed. So what I want to say with this, this really has matured to a, a form of engineering, where you can really tailor um, an object so that it meets your specifications. So Dinaragami is actually not so young anymore. So the first instance of Dinaragami um, appeared in 2006. It's like single layer Dinaragami. This is what inspired me and actually made me go into this field. Um, I had opportunity to contribute to the invention of um, design ideas, how to make multi-layer um, objects a little later um, in Boston. And then uh, ever since um, in Munich here, we actually have been working on pushing um, and maturing this technology so that it could be used in reality, like high yield synthesis, we learned how to make uh, the dynamic assemblies which can change their shape so they can have some kind of more robot-like structures. We learned how to make ever larger objects which are even bigger than viruses actually so that uh, you can work with viruses if you wanted to. We learned how to um, uh, mass produce the ingredients and also the resulting objects with high quality and also in large quantities in a cost-efficient way. We learned how to stabilize these kind of objects so that you can take them out of the sort of the context in which they're being made into other contexts such as vacuum or blood, um, other environments where they will then you know, maintain their structure. And also lately last year actually we learned how to make motors, even nanomotors, um, using the origami components. So basically the point is there that we really started to think about, okay, now we need to see what we, what we can do in the real world with, uh, with the fabrication technology. Um, and this is um, the point where the Federal Agency of Disruptive Innovation comes in. Um, so I uh, agreed that this is time to take this uh, um, reality and with, with them together, we are pursuing three different directions. And I'd like to um, ask Nicola Kegel on stage, um, who's the CEO um, of a Sprint subsidiary called Nanogami um, and also innovation manager at the, at the agency. And um, she'll talk about one application, which is next generation biochips. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Nicola. I am an innovation manager at the Federal Agency for Disruptive Innovation at Sprint, and I'm also the CEO of one of our subsidiaries, like Hendrik just says, said that's called Nanogami, that is basically developing the projects we're seeing here. And the project that I want to show you is how we want to develop the next generation of biochips. 
So if I say that, people usually ask me, what is a biochip? And well, there are like vastly different types of biochips, but essentially it's a chip that senses biological molecules and they are very sim simple ones like the corona um, rapid antigen test, test that we all know. Um, it's cheap, you can use it at home, but it only gives you a very simple answer. Yes, you have corona or no. And on the other hand, we have very, very complex chips that have billions of sensors on them and they can give you very in-depth information about what is going on in a tissue sample or in a blood sample. But the problem with those chips is, is, is that they are expensive and they have to run in really expensive machines that are in a laboratory. Um, so you won't get an answer right away, way, but um, it'll take some time, it'll cost, cost you. And now what we want to do at Nanogami is basically create tests with chips that we develop that take the best of both worlds. So you want to create chip, uh, t uh, chips that, are, that you can um, put in a device like this so that you can do a test at home from a blood sample or another tissue sample and they will give you results within minutes that are just in, as in-depth as the results you get from one of these really, really complex chips these days. And this is important because if we do understand what's going on in our bodies, and if we can do so on a daily basis, um, we will catch diseases that are developing really, really early on. And with that, we can, for example, catch a cardiovascular disease or a cancer or also an infectious disease before they can create real harm. And that would be fantastic. So many of you might think right now, I've heard that story before, presented by a woman. and that it isn't, didn't necessarily go so well. <laughs> well, I think what we've learned from Theranos is that having such tests would be uh, tremendously valuable for our society. But I think what also Theranos was lacking was the technology to develop these kind of tests, and that's where we come in. Um, so... I will try now to explain to you <laughs> how we want to build a chip that, that does exactly that and that, um, that basically makes this dream a, re uh, a reality. And the chip that we would like to build functions pretty much like a sensoric semiconductor chip, like for example this one, which is the chip that's in your cell phone camera. It senses light. Yeah? And what we want to do is basically do exactly the same, but instead of light, we sense biological molecules. And just as you get a picture right away after you take that, um, with such a chip, we can get the information out of the biological sample and you can see the results right away in your electronic device, for example, your smartphone. So how does that work? If you zoom into such a semiconductor sensor, um, you can actually see that the chip consists of, um, of billions of pixels, and each one of those pixels is a sensor in itself. And, um, <coughs> and what we now need to do, if we want to create a sensor that senses biological molecules, we need to add a surface to that sensor that actually reacts to bi biological mo molecules. Um, but the problem we have um, right now, or like up to th up to this point, this is current technology, so everybody, so lots of people can do that. But what the problem we're having right now is, um, biologic if you biological molecules, you can't grasp them because they're so tiny. You can't organize them, and if you want to build something that can sense molecules, several biological molecules in a sensor need to work together, and we can only do that if we precisely position them, and that's where DNA origami comes in. So what we do is we use the technology that Hendrik just explained and build these Dana origami breadboards. And with the ability of DNA origami, we can precisely place any biological molecule that we would like in the exact position where it needs to be so that these molecules work together. 
And then we can place these DNA pieces on top of that surface on a sensor. And now in the present of a biological sample, the analytes, so basically the molecules we would like to measure, they can bind to the sensor and create the biochemical reaction that we then can measure with that pixel. Obviously, in a real chip, there will be billions of those sensors, um, so we can create a lot of data points from a sample and it create a very in-depth um, view on the sample that we've received and uh, understand uh, in very much depth what's going on. Um, one thing I would like to add here is um, this technology is also really cheap. So we can create um, 100 billion of these sensoric nanostructures for just one euro. And uh, with that, we believe um, that we are able to create tests that can actually be used on a daily basis. Um, and like that, we believe that we can actually create a future where we know a lot more, a lot earlier, um, what's going on in our bodies and live a healthier life because we just don't develop diseases. And in case we do develop diseases, um, we have also um, a solution for that presented by Klaus, who's the CEO of Plectonic, and he'll tell you how we use DNA origami to fight cancer. Hello, everybody. We at Plectonic, we aim to revolutionize the way we treat cancer today. We at Plectonic work in the field of cancer immunotherapy. Cancer immunotherapy <coughs> is using the body's own immune system to combat cancerous cells in a very targeted manner. And this is what you could slightly see here. So you see an immune cell that is actually attacking a tumor cell via one of its surface markers. By doing so, the cells interact with one another and form an interface. And why are this interface? The immune cell is actually poisoning the tumor cell. So we at Plectonic, we like to make this process even more efficient and even more safer at the same time. And how this could potentially look like? <coughs> If we have a look at the cellular environment here, so you see a tumor cell in red and a smaller immune cell here in black. And once you add the right drug, the immune cell is actually able to stick to the tumor cell. By doing so, these cells interact with one another, they fight, and over time, the immune cell will unbind again. And now let's have a closer look here to what is to what is actually happening to the tumor cell. Oh, sorry. So, exactly. So, if you have now a look at the tumor cell, it actually changes its color, it changes its size and shape and its morphology. And what you see is a dead cell, and the cell actually died while the constructed interaction to an immune cell. And when you have a look at this whole procedure now, this just took a couple of hours. And this also will take just a couple of hours in your body. And it looks pretty easy, right? But the whole problem here with cancer is that a tumor cell is actually a degenerated healthy cell. So once you have a look at the tumor cell and the healthy cell here, um, the immune system would not know which cell to attack, right? Because both cells carry this blue marker in general, an antigen. And by just adding a drug that addresses the blue marker, you, you would cause very high side effects. Luckily, these cells do have a bunch of different antigens on the surface. So we are now able to not only address the red or the blue marker, but to tackle the tumor very precisely. We should address the pattern of red and blue at the same time. So maximizing the hit on the tumor and minimizing the overlap to healthy tissue. And our solution to that problem is a nano switch for antibodies. And here 
our core competence, what Henrik presented, the DNA origami technology comes in. So what you see here in gray are DNA double helices arranged to a stable core and to a flexible part in the middle. To scale and in color, you see on the bottom and on the top side binders. Normally we use antibodies, we are, but we are open actually to a bunch of different binders here. And the on and off state of our switch is defined via the accessibility of the orange binder here in the middle. Within a cellular context where you have different markers for a tumor cell and for an immune cell, the switch works as follows. So in solution, it's in the off state, but it can bind to the tumor cell. By recognizing the pattern, there's a conformational change. It presents a second set, which can then engage an immune cell. And by doing so, you trigger a direct response from the immune system to the tumor. In case of a healthy cell, the switch could actually bind to this cell, but there is no conformational change and the immune system cannot bind to the healthy tissue and over time, the drug will unbind again. With this technology, <coughs> we can actually place this into the context of, let's say, immunotherapies in general. And these are defined via two parameters. So one is the efficacy, which should be desirably very high. And on the other hand, you have the toxicity, which you want on the low level. What you see here are state-of-the-art immunotreatments, which are very efficacious for certain indications, like CAR T-cells or bispecific antibodies but they do show a certain profile of toxicity for other indications, so they are not transferable to cancer in general. And our aim is not to develop like the next point along the line here, but we want to actually develop therapies that are more efficacious and safer at the same time. And we believe that with our technology, we can actually set up a new class of therapeutics that we term as logibodies, which stands for logic-gated antibodies. Over the last years, we have developed the technology, and so far we can say a logibody really works. We have shown that we can treat a bunch of different cancer types, ranging from solid to liquid tumors. By addressing a pattern of antigens, we significantly reduce the side effects, and at the same time, we could already prove the reduction of the tumor burden in animal models. Based on our work so far and our findings, we actually would like to enter clinical testing within the next years. And we do that together with Print, which is actually financing our project for the next five years to bring logic to cancer immunotherapy. But with DNA origami, we can actually do more. We can not only fight against cancer, but we can also fight against viruses. And with that, I would like to hand over to Christian, the CEO of Capsitech. Thank you very much, Klaus. So we at Capsitec, um, we develop a broad spectrum platform to, tr to treat um, viral diseases using DNA nanotechnology or DNA origami, what we learned in the, in the beginning. So I guess all of you have experienced what impact viruses can have on our daily lives within the last um, three years. But SARS-CoV-2 is really just only one example of, of 200 viral diseases known um, that infect humans. So even without a pandemic, there are millions of people that die every year and enormous economic damage that, that's caused. And the reason for this is that there are only 10 viral diseases that are currently, be, currently treatable with current antiviral drugs. For the rest, there's no, no treatment available. So we want to change this with a concept that, that we call the virus trap. So, so what's the virus trap? How does this work? Viruses, they need to bind to the surfaces of cells in order to trans infect the cell and in order to replicate. And that's the step where we interfere. So what we do is we build shells with DNA origami that are large enough to fit antivirus particles. We then can modify the inside of these shells with virus binding molecules like an antibody, like a peptide, a polymer, anything that binds to a virus. Viruses then can enter these shells and become irreversibly trapped. And by trapping these viruses, they can no, lo no longer interact with the cell surface and, and are neutralized and the, the virus replication is stopped. So what we can really do is it, it, we, we can create a plug and play antiviral platform. So we can take any virus binding molecule, can be an antibody that's very specific for a certain virus, could be a cell receptor, 
um, could also be a polymer that has a broad affinity for many viruses, anything that has a binding affinity to a virus. Um, we can add this to the virus trap and make it sticky to the target virus and then obtain our functional antiviral. By doing this, we, we could already show that we have an enhanced efficacy of, of um, antiviral drugs. We also um, could increase the resilience against virus mutations. So a, a, a big problem for, for um, current antivirals is um, that the viruses mutate and then the efficacy of the drug um, is, is lost. We can um, um, at least increase, uh, decrease this with, with our virus trap platform. And we can also create completely new antivirals um, de novo. Here you see one example of a, such a virus that is trapped inside, a, inside the virus trap. So this is similar. Um, to, the, to the structures Henrik showed in the beginning. It's, it's not a model here. This is real data um, acquired with cryo-electron microscopy um, of a chikungunya virus that is trapped inside such a, a virus trap. And you, could, you can see that it's very nicely um, enclosed by, by the trap. You don't see the virus binding molecules um, because they average in the image reconstruction, but without them, the, the virus wouldn't be trapped inside the shell. And chikungunya is one example. So we've, we've trapped many, many different viruses. We have trapped uh, adeno-associated virus, polio, dengue, noro, human papilloma virus, SARS-CoV-2, chikungunya influenza, um, and adenoviruses. And, and really, the only thing we needed to change was the size of the, of the virus traps. So for the smaller viruses, a smaller shell was needed. Um, for the bigger ones, like adeno, um, we used a bigger shell. Currently, we use a, a, a shell prototype that can be used for um, viruses a, across different, different sizes. And what's, what I like a lot about this slide is that, in, except of influenza, all these viruses were trapped in shells that had the same coating on the inside. So here we use really a polymer that has a binding affinity for many different viruses. So it's sticky for, for many different viruses. So really, with the, the same shells, we could trap different viruses, like polio, dengue, noro, were all trapped with the, with the identical shell. Um, so this really proves the, the um, idea that, that this could be a broad spectrum um, um, antiviral. We've also shown that this virus trapping works in vitro for more than 10 viruses now, and also could show that it neutralizes the virus. So what, you, what we do is we use human cell culture and infect them with viruses, but when we, when we add the um, the virus trap, the cells are not longer in infected. We've also done um, in vivo work already. So we um, did some, some safety studies and didn't observe any severe side effects. Uh, the shells are only made out of DNA, so we didn't also didn't expect a lot. But this is good, so this is already tested. And what we're currently doing is we're doing um, in vivo efficacy tests for multiple virus indications. So mice get infected with a virus. And if they're not treated, they either get really sick or it, it might even die. Um, so we, we, um, we treat them with our virus traps. And we already have very promising preliminary data from ongoing um, in vivo tests that, that actually are currently in, in progress. Yeah, so we, we envision that in, in the future we have a solution um, to fight all these remaining viruses, viral diseases. Um, so that we don't have to put the humans in quarantine anymore, but um, the viruses. And with this, I'm handing over back to, to Nicola, who's um, also we're um, supported and, and financed by Sprint. Um, so Nicola's going to say a little bit more about, about Sprint. Thank you. So um, yeah, we've heard a little bit of sp about Sprint um, already. So what, does, what do we do at Sprint? Um, Sprint is the federal agency for disruptive innovation. And as the name says, we are looking for disruptive innovation. And we're looking at research institutions, at universities, at companies, and, at, and with individuals. And if we do find an innovation that we think could be truly disruptive, we help turning those innovations into competitive businesses. Um, yeah, that's uh, Rafael, who's over there, who's, the, who's, our, who's our director. And uh, the, so, so if we, if we um, so when do we, uh, so what kind of innovations do we deem to be uh, disruptive or truly disruptive? So how do we think? So we uh, believe that a disruptive inno innovation is then disruptive if, in, if it can create 
an entirely new industry or fundamentally change an existing one. And so change, hopefully, our lives for the better. Um, and now the question, why did we pick DNA origami as of, uh, one of those uh, innovations that we, uh, th that, we, that we support? So our thinking here is actually quite simple. We as humankind learned how to engineer machines a couple of centuries ago. And today we don't have 10 or thousands of machines. We have actually millions of disruptive machines that make our daily lives easier. And if we now, with DNA origami, develop the ability to engineer machines on the nanoscale, a similar development will happen. And in a couple of years, we're not, see, we're not gonna see 10 different nano robots. We're gonna see thousands of them performing important tasks that will help us solve important problems like curing cancer or performing medical diagnosis or avoiding infectious diseases um, and with that potentially the next pandemic. So thank you very much to listen to us and uh, if there are questions I'd like to ask the team to come back on stage. Thank you very much. That was really impressive, uh, especially the, the the sizes at which you're operating. So um, I really like that. I have a lot of questions on my plate, but as always, your questions first. So please try to gain our attention, maybe by raising your hand if you have certain questions. I'm with Hayek. Yeah, third row now, please. Um, very good question. We get this asked quite a lot. So um, we're we also investigating this at the moment. But what we think um, is that there are immune cells that eat the entire complex, the shell with the virus, and, and degrade it. So viruses have a very particular way how they um, usually infect cells. And if they are trapped inside the shell, uh, they, they can't use the system anymore and, and are just degraded in, in immune cells. I, I hope this kind of answers the question. But, but we're also investigating this at the moment. Thank you very much for the for the first question. Maybe I'd like to add uh, another question on this. Um, Klaus, when you presented uh, your potential solution for cancer, um, I really liked the, the matrix you showed. Um, and I had a kind of uh, Steve Jobs iPhone moment uh, when you said, well, we are on, uh, on the lower uh, left corner and on the, on the upper left corner with our solutions. But nevertheless, there might be some toxicity, I think, um, was the, the lower scale. And there might be some side effects. So what could we expect there, even though they are, of course, um, nothing compared to the other side effects? Yeah, absolutely. So <coughs> it's likely that there will be a slight chance for side effects, of course. Yeah. Um, but if you have a look at state-of-the-art treatments at the moment, um, for example, like radiation or, or other therapies where we poison the whole body, um, this is way more targeted. Mm -hmm. And our approach has, for the first time, the ability now to bring together molecules that you could not systematically inject to humans without creating very, very severe side effects. So there are examples of molecules that have been tested where the patients went within 24 hours into, into the clinics. Mm -hmm. And uh, we believe that by positioning binders or antibodies in a way on the origami that we logically activate them or just locally activate them, um, we could significantly reduce these effects. Thank, thank you very much. Further questions from the audience? I can hand the microphone, whoever needs to know where. I'll give you a microphone. If you raise your hand and are not seen, then just speak up. Yeah. Thanks, Hendrik. Uh, I have one question. So thank you all for the, for the nice presentations and all the scientific details. Um, I have one, questions one question regarding the um, immunology or the immunogenic um, yeah, um, settings or capabilities of these uh, nanogami. So are they actually recognized by the immune system? And if so, like before they are basically unfolded, and if so, do they cause any um, immune responses? 
Um, I don't need the microphone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So that's a great question. And um, actually, um, so there's a lot of experience with DNA as a as a medication. So before RNA vaccines, actually people have worked for decades on DNA vaccines, and they were largely abandoned because they lacked an efficacy, but they were safe. So there's actually a lot of clinical trial data on um, DNA vaccines on which on which we can build, so people understand the immunogenic effects of um, DNA itself. And the, our bodies really haven't evolved a lot of defense mechanisms against DNA. They're mostly focused on foreign proteins, for example, like you, you get it from viral pathogens. So um, there are specific mechanisms that we can address by engineering and prevent them to be turned on. For example, we cloak these objects with a polymer layer so that they're not being recognized by nucleases. Um, and then also, I mean, yeah, and there are other mechanisms which can be evaded, which are sequence specific. And then and still, of course, this needs to be tested in detail. Um, and that's part of our research program to address the immunogenicity. Thank you very much. Um, another question which is not so um, deeply science focused, um, but N Nicola, I'd like to ask you, how did the four of you got together in the first place? <laughs> They, like, uh, yeah, everybody applied at Sprint. We looked at the projects and we were fascinated um, by that technology and the versatility. And uh, we, we, we looked into everything in detail and we had, like, external um, experts um, to look at, look at the things and the scientific results as well and got back um, a lot of confirmation that this actually could be something. And that's why we felt like, okay, this is truly interesting to basically support such a field that has so much potential um, in different areas and decided to do it. Yeah, and I can just imagine that uh, with this scientific breakthrough that there are several thousands of use cases, how you can apply this in practice. How did you then try to select the most promising ones? Um, what we do is... Um, We've, we have people come up to us and basically tell up us what they would like to be working on because they've been working on that in that field for, for years and years and years. They know much more than we do about what are the most promising uh, applications. So um, the the reality is um, so so th so the reality is like we don't come up with the ideas what should be should be done. It's the teams that come to us that tell us. Yeah. Um, and we just select from what we have there. And that really truly depends on what we think, what our external experts think. And um, each of those cases that we see here in itself have enormous potential to become a disruptive innovation. And that's what, what we always think about. If we cure cancer, that's great. If we cure viral diseases, that's fantastic. And if we have uh, diagnostics chips, it, it chips in our pocket that we can use on a daily basis that tell us what's going on in ourselves, that's also disruptive. So. I guess that's the easy answer, like come with something disruptive. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. Further questions from the audience? I'm not looking angry, I try to see you, so. <laughs> yeah, please. Thank you. And uh, maybe, Nicola, this is a question for you as well. Um, so my name is Julia, and I was wondering, so you said they applied for your programs or your um, support, but how do you go out actively to find innovation, disruptive innovations? We do what we do now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, 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 um, so um, what we do is we go to conferences, we do talks. Um, I think Raphael is, is really like uh, go just um, talking a lot to people, podcasts. Um, we have uh, partnerships managers who are in universities who are scouting. We have innovation managers like myself who um, talk to people um, that are there. And then um, usually we help, we inspire people come with big ideas and when they do I, I mean they can also like when they know us somebody can come to me for example personally and just talk to me and see say okay do you think that would be something that might be interesting for sprint we i don't know encourage them to apply 
Yeah, maybe if I uh, if I can add uh, two points on that uh, because I think it's a very good question. Um, in the afternoon on the dome stage, there are two further touch points you can have with Sprint. For example, the introduction of a new challenge. I think with a focus on manufacturing, and the second uh, part is um, that Sprint is also part of a life science panel that I have the honor to host. So if you want to know more about Sprint, just um, after the lunch break, um, take another door and enter the dome stage, maybe to complete this answer. Further questions from the audience? I think we have time for one or two quick ones. Okay, then I have a, a closing question, Henrik, uh, to you. Because you, show, you showed that uh, I think you were inspired to enter the field 2006. Mm -hmm. and now you're standing in the year 2023 here on stage um, discussing solutions to cancer, to viruses. Was that the kind of uh, research you imagined you'd be doing in the future, 2006, or um, is, this, is this a co completely different uh, path? But um, and how do you feel about that? It's a um, little bit of superposition, uh, superposition of both things. I mean, I always want to do something that somehow engineers something which can do something new in, in the real world, yeah. and I really like building super small things. I was <laughs> inspired as a as a student from the molecular machines you can find in our body and somehow there was this idea I want to be able to build something similar but I didn't have a specific vision yet like you know what could be used for because you f first needed to pursue th this idea a little bit to the point that you can actually develop more specific ideas and I think we started to think seriously around 2017 about what are sort of realistic and impactful use cases where we can do something in the real world and specifically in health and that's the, the key turning point for us when we learned how to make mass amounts of these um, objects really cheaply because that wasn't possible. So that was sort of um, the, the turning point. So I think it's like initially it's just a generic wish to do something which has not been done before and just also yeah. like a passion for these kind of things. And then I think also then it locked into the specific, uh, these specific use cases. And then of course, and it's always uh, great. I mean, Christian and Klaus, they actually, they all did their, um, PhDs in my laboratory. And we're kind of like a locally grown weed here in Munich. It's actually a lot of talent and all somehow are centered around this um, this kind of technology. And they all have, I'm, I'm happy to see it, like an entrepreneurial mindset. So yeah. try to make um, these visions a reality in, in companies. So I, I like that. I think that's that's great. And I'm, I'm so happy that we can <laughs> take this further in, in, into the real world. So I look forward. Yeah. Many thanks. Um, and with this, I would close this, this session as well, again, with a huge round of applause for the four of you. Many thanks. <laughs>